Welcome back everybody. So today we're going to have a look at the most fundamental linear control laws that exist out there. Those are your proportional control law, your proportional derivative control law, and finally the proportional derivative integral or so-called PID control law. And right after that we're going to jump into how can we select the gains of a PD control law to satisfy what's known as a transient a performance of the system. Okay, so the transient performance is, in other words, your desired behavior that the client wants out of its controller, such that you, as the engineer, can take those specifications and go about the design of the controller, or in other words, how to calculate the gains of a controller. All right, so that'll be first in 5.3. Have a look at typical. control laws and specifically typical linear control laws okay because this course is all about the basic in terms of feedback control systems applied to spacecraft attitude dynamics but still uh, in practice we do use a lot of linear control laws so it's not as if this isn't being used practically there is a great deal of control systems on board spacecraft that do employ very simple linear control laws. Okay, so the first one is our so-called proportional control law. Control law. Five point three point one. Widely referred to simply a P control law. So if you look at the controller in terms of block scheme diagram, what comes in is the error in the time domain. And notice that when I'm going to talk about time domain variables, I'm going to use lowercase letters or symbols as opposed to the Laplace domain where I had used capital letters or capital symbols thus far, okay? So this is the error coming in. And this error will simply get multiplied by a gain kp such that the output will be produced okay like that there's something wrong with that marker it's a new one and it seems to be watery or something okay so that's all there is such that the control law or the equation that will allow us to calculate uh, what we need to feed into the plant is going to be simply u equal kp times the error. Or if you want to put that in terms of transfer function, g of s of your controller will simply be the output over the input. So output over input such that the transfer function will simply be a gain, a proportional gain denoted by Kp. So here I've used the, uh, the variable e to denote the error. So this error is actually defined as being the reference signal minus the actual output of the plant which you remember that in our case, this output of the plant is the rotation angle about a single axis. And that's what we had denoted as theta before, okay? So this is Y, the output of the plant. Now here we're gonna use a little trick and assume that our reference signal or in our application, the desired angle will be a constant signal so not time varying okay so simply r is a constant minus the time varying output of the plant like that such that if you go back to our double integrator dynamics for spacecraft attitude motion where we had j theta double dot equal to u 
remember that, U as the input of the plant or the applied torque. Well, the applied torque is being calculated by the control law, which is simply Kp times the error. So I'm going to come back here and say this equal Kp times the error, which varies as function of time, but for conciseness, I'm going to drop the function of time here. So Kp times the error, and the error was defined here as being the reference signal minus the time varying output. Or specifically in our case, we're talking about the actual angle. And all this is for J theta double up. Turns out that this equation is actually the equation of a spring damper system. And this is very convenient because it allows us to better visualize and uh, come up with a mechanical analogy that would describe the behavior of our dynamical system under a proportional control action. Okay? Because this happens to be a spring damper system, which means the following. So it means that you have your reference signal or desired angle, R, which is a constant. So that's kind of the wall, if you will, on which we attach a spring. No, that's not a spring damper. Spring mass, sorry. There's no damper. The damper will come with the derivative action that we're going to find in the PD controller. Okay, spring mass. So all we're adding here is a spring like that of stiffness quantified by Kp. And this end here of the spring will actually be the actual angle of our spacecraft or the actual output of the plant. Okay? And this is just an oscillatory behavior, if you will, okay? So the more you stretch a spring, the more it's going to come back and oscillate. So this gives you a very oscillatory behavior in terms of the response you would see at the output of your plant. So it's not the best situation you can think of. Yes, the controller is very simple, and that is the most simplest, the most simple controller ever. But the price to pay is a very inaccurate response of the system because you're going to get those oscillations. Because all you have is a spring between the actual output of the plant, the angle of the spacecraft, and with respect to its desired angle. So, for that reason, people said, hey, why don't we add a damper to the system? And that would be a fantastic idea. And indeed, that is a fantastic idea. And that led to the derivation of the so-called PD controller, or proportional derivative controller. Okay, 5.3.2. Proportional derivative control not, or simply referred to as PD. Okay? So the actual control law for PD will be our gain KP. As per before, that was multiplying the error between the reference signal in the actual plant output. Now plus a derivative term times the rate of change of said error. Okay, so this is the controller in the time domain. Time domain. But you might be interested in to figuring out the transfer function of this controller, g of s. And that would simply be k p plus k d s. Okay? simply by taking the Laplace operator to that operation, 
that would become u of s, kp stays kp, times e of s, plus kd, stays kd as a constant, times s, times e, okay? And then solve for the uh, output over the input, or in other words, u over e, and that's what you would get as a transfer function for a PD control law. All right, so let's plug this back into our double integrator dynamical model that remember we had obtained at the beginning of this chapter by saying that the angular uh, component, that the components of the angular velocity were all small, such that the gyroscopic effect can effectively be neglected. Uh, equal to u, or the applied uh, control torque to that, which is just going to be this here. So kpe plus the derivative gain denoted by kd times rate of change in error. And here we're going to do the same as before, so we're going to assume that the error is simply r as a constant uh, value minus the current output of the plant which is the angle about that single axis okay plus kd times the rate of change of this so that would be r dot minus theta dot but because r we said that we're assuming that this is a constant then that just means that this is going to be uh, zero because r dot well do it also. R dot minus theta dot and R dot is zero. Essentially, you are left with minus theta dot that multiplies k d. Okay? Just like that. So J theta double dot. And this is great because this is actually our spring damper equation. Okay, so going back to the mechanical analogy, that means that we have our reference signal, our wall essentially, onto which we are attaching a spring of stiffness quantified by Kp and a damper like that. That's equivalent to our KD. That's the new element we have inserted into the previous control, controller, which was only KP. And then this are both attached to the current output of the plant or the current rotational angle in terms of spacecraft attitude motion. So that would give us an oscillatory behavior, but with damp uh, magnitude, okay? So we would see something like this, which is great. Instead of ending up with the sustained oscillations at the output of the plant in terms of angle that you would get with a pure proportional controller, now those oscillations are going to get damped just by adding the damper to the system or by adding the derivative control action. You note that the controller that you obtain when you assume that the reference signal is a constant value is what I refer to as a modified PD control law as opposed to the full controller which doesn't assume that R is a constant and thereby here you would get plus KD times R dot minus theta dot that would be the full PD control law. But here, by assuming that R is constant, we ended up for the second term with minus KD times theta dot simply. So that is kind of the particular case of the most generic PD control law, which works with time-varying reference signal. So again, just keep in mind that when I'm going to talk about the modified PD control law, I am assuming that R is going to be a constant angle that we are shooting for as opposed to time varying trajectory, okay? And that makes you happy, okay? This is 
a great behavior. And this is why the PD controller is so widely used as opposed to the regular or the very basic proportional controller. This is very rare, rare that the practical application would rely on such a simple proportional controller for its uh, control system. But PD controller, I'd say 90% of all uh, automated machines or dynamical systems that are feedback controlled rely on the PD controller, okay? Now, because of the uh, control duality problem we talked about of a controller not being able to, uh, to uh, cancel the effects of perturbations while simultaneously canceling the effects of sensor noise, this is where the extra 10% are coming in for more advanced controllers, nonlinear controllers, adaptive controllers, robust controllers, and so on and so on. But PD controller, very efficient. Okay? The main drawback with PD controller is that if you apply a constant external perturbation to the system, Okay, and that's what we're going to see next. So still within the PD controller, but let's now assume, so let's add a constant external perturbation to the system. Or in other words, coming back to the spacecraft attitude control, it's as if we are adding a constant uh, perturbing torque onto the plant. So now the plant will be influenced not only by the controller producing the control torque, but the disturbance coming in as well and torquing the spacecraft in an adverse fashion. So going back to the mechanical analogy, it's as if you had the damper here, the spring here, with the plant output, the current angle of the spacecraft. That's your KP, that's your KD. But then you are taking this side and you are pulling on it with a constant perturbation torque like that. So in other words, the controller would have to fight quite a bit more to cancel the effect of that. But the PD controller won't give you exactly what you want. You're going to get with what's known as a steady state error, as I'm about to show you. Okay. So back into the uh, double integrator dynamics equation, you're going to get J angular acceleration equal to control action minus k d a the dot plus now the extra nasty term at the end here and as I said this term has the effect of causing a steady state error what do I mean by steady state? Steady state means when the system has reached a state where the derivative of its variables and the second time derivative of any variables are all equal to zero. So let's do that. So now this is going to be equal to zero, equal to kp r minus theta minus zero plus perturbing uh, torque such that the error in steady state defined as r minus theta whenever theta is equal to zero and theta double dot is equal to zero will then be minus tau p over kp. And that is because that was actually equivalent to R minus theta evaluated when theta dot equal theta double dot equal to zero. Okay, so what does that mean? 
Well, that means that you don't get exactly what you wish for. This is time angle. So you set the reference to be here. So what you want to achieve is this, right? With a PD is oscillations, but a damping of those oscillations thanks to the derivative term you've inserted in, into the controller so that ultimately you get exactly the command. Well, that's great, but now if you had a constant torque to the system, you're going to get oscillations, but oscillations that will converge to not exactly the desired or the reference signal. Notice that there is an offset. Well, that offset here is the steady state error. which is directly correlated to the magnitude of the perturbation you added to the system and your uh, spring stiffness value, Kp, okay? So the larger the Kp, the smaller the steady state error will be, uh, but then the price to pay is that you're gonna need to use a lot of force to achieve the desired or close to the perfect response. Yet you'll never be able to reach a steady state error of zero because that would mean that Kp is equal to infinity, and most systems won't be able to deal with that because they don't have the actuation capability to drive the amount of force that would be associated, or the amount of torque that would be associated with a Kp of a, such a high value, okay? So in other words, with proportional derivative under a constant uh, perturbation, you will for sure get some steady state error which might be acceptable for a given application, but people said, okay, what if we'd like to get rid of that? Well, the solution was to use the proportional derivative or proportional integral derivative or PID controller. the 5.3.3 with proportional integral derivative control law or PID as an abbreviation. So the PID control law is very similar to the PD control law. So you get KP times error plus KD error dot. If you talk about the uh, generic PD control law, not the modified one, okay? But then they've added a third term, which is KI, times the integral of zero and T of the error as a function of time DT. And you can also turn that into transfer function, if that's what you want to do. That would be Kp plus Kd times S plus Ki. And an integrator in the Laplace domain, as you know, is 1 over S, like that. So this term here will very effectively handle or take care of canceling the steady state error. Caused by the constant perturbing torque that was always pulling on the spring and the damper, if you use the mechanical analogy we've used. Okay? So you say, wow, that's great. Why don't people use PID all the time? Well, the main problem is that if you look at what you've added here, is effectively a pole right at the origin of the complex plane. And that can be a very uh, risky situation because now you're, you don't have all the poles of the system on the right-hand side of the complex plane. 
but you have one right at the margin between stability or asymptotic stability and unstable behavior, right? So if something goes wrong, just by a tiny bit, that pole at the origin could very well flip onto the right-hand side of the complex plane and leave the system to be completely unstable. One such situation is whenever you have time delays in the system, right? Because remember that sensors were adding noise to the current output of the plant, based on our discussion in the last lecture. But typically hardware, in terms of sensing uh, devices, would also introduce delays. Maybe one millisecond of delay, two milliseconds of delay. And those delays in the complex plane are acting as a wind blowing towards the right. So if these are the poles of the system with no delay, you say, ha, ah, that's great. Everything is on the left-hand side of the complex plane, so everything is asymptotically stable. That's great. I'm done. I'm going home. But then if the actual sensor you add in the feedback loop is introducing delays, it means that all those poles will start to drift towards the right. And the more delays is introduced, the more those poles are going to drift. And ultimately, you could have poles that are going to switch onto the right-hand side of the complex plane. Boom, boom, and now you're done. There's too much delay for the controller to handle the situation. Or in other words, the controller is always acting on the past value of the actual output of the plant. So the plant is further along, but the controller is always behind in trying to catch up. And if that time difference between the current output and what the controller uses to play with in terms of this measured output or the sense output, well, the thing just goes unstable as a closed loop system because those poles have now flipped onto the right hand side. So if under nominal conditions, you are already at adding a pole here at the origin, guess what? The slightly less time delay would cause that pole to move here and now you're done. So that is very risky. The other problem with the integrator term is that if for some reason, assuming you have uh, no delays in the system, so assuming that there is no way that the error could be driven to zero due, for example, to noise, right? If you were to look at an error signal when everything is ideal, no noise, no delays, it could be looking something like that and converging smoothly to zero. No problem at all. No steady state error, done. But then if you introduce noise in the system through sensing devices or sensors, the error signal will be noisy. And those small oscillations will mean that the error, although could oscillate, about zero will never be equal to zero. And guess what? An integrator will pick that up and will keep increasing with time and increasing and increasing. And you know, all you know is that this guy goes to the, through the roof. And this is what we call the integrator wind up effect. Wind up? Probably wind up. You probably know what I mean. The integrator term just explodes causing the control signal to go through the roof and you're done. You've lost the mission. The spacecraft goes crazy about spinning about all three axes at the same time in an un uncontrollable fashion. So yes, in theory, PID controller is great, especially when you have perturbations acting on the system. But in practice, be very, very careful with those. Okay? So as you can tell, I'm not the biggest fan of PID controllers. <laughs> this is a takeaway here. Okay, so now that we've seen uh, the most fundamental linear control laws, P, PD, and PID, let's have a quick look at how we could design those and how can we relate what the customer wants in terms of time domain specifications and how to relate that to the practical calculations of the control gains of your controller.
and that would be in 5.4 when we're going to talk about time domain specifications. Or in other words, how to calculate the control gains. And when I say control gains, obviously I refer to either KP for proportional controller, KP and KD for derivative controller, or proportional derivative controller, or KP, KD, KI for a proportional integral derivative controller. I just switch back to the watery black marker. You're done. I don't want you on my team anymore. Gee, brand new. Okay, that looks much better. So how to calculate control gains to satisfy those specifications. Or in other words, your job uh, that will be expected from U.S. engineers uh, working on the control system of a spacecraft. Okay. Uh, well, the first thing to ask yourself is what do I want in the first place? Fundamentally, what do we want? Do we want an unstable closed-loop system? No, no thanks. Do we want a stable closed loop system? If that's what you want, uh, your expectations aren't high enough because you know that you could uh, achieve stability with passive techniques. No controllers needed. Just spin a spacecraft about a single axis or just uh, make sure that you have deployable gravity gradient booms. Choose the gravity gradient effect, your advantage, and boom, you're done. You stabilize your spacecraft passively. But here, we want better than stability because we want asymptotic stability, okay? But first and foremost, we want asymptotic stability. We don't want the angle of our spacecraft to oscillate about a given value. We want the attitude to maybe oscillate in the beginning, but then slowly stop oscillating and converge exactly or as close as we can to what we want in terms of desired pointing angle or orientation of our spacecraft. Okay. Good. So, what I mean by that is that the relationship between RS, the reference signal, which could be either just an angle in terms of orientation that we're shooting for, or a time-varying orientation in terms of time history. So, I want you to go from here to here, but through this very specific path. And you would feed the control system with different theta values as time goes by. So you'd feed the trajectory of theta with time that you want the controller to closely track. Okay? Boom. This is more challenging for a controller than just doing what we refer to as set point control. And that's just feeding the controller with the constant and you say, okay, start from wherever you are, I don't care, but I want you to be at that specific orientation that is not changing with time. So this is the reference signal that we're going to compare with the plant output to generate the error signal that is going to be fed to our controller, G C of S. Our controller will then calculate U of S, the control actions, that we're going to feed our plant, GP of S. So we're going to feed our plant with U of S and our plant will then react to that and generate a new output or generate a new angle 
and spacecraft attitude application. That angle is being fed back compared to the desired angle, generate an angle error, feed that to a controller. The controller will say, okay, I want to drive this to zero, so therefore the torque needs to be whatever. That torque is physically produced by actuators, which will then modify the acceleration or angular acceleration to gen generate a new angle. That angle is compared at the next time step with the reference signal again, and the closed loop goes on and on like that, okay? So what we want here is we want the closed loop transfer function between this signal and that one to be asymptotically stable. And not only any asymptotically stable system, but a system that will ensure that the time domain specifications are completely satisfied, okay? So you want the customer to be happy. You want NASA to be happy. You want the Canadian Space Agency who's hiring you to be happy. You want that company to make millions of dollars. That's what you want. Okay? So if you look at the transfer function between Y of S and R, in other words, Y of S being the output over the global input. The transfer function, as we've seen previously, will just be JP times GC over 1 plus GP GC of S, right? So we want that transfer function to have all of its poles. Where? Do we want some on the imaginary axis? That'd be quite risky, right? That'd be very risky. I wouldn't suggest that. So ideally, we would, would want to have all of these poles related to the denominator of this big transfer function to lie where? Well, to lie on the left-hand side of the complex plane. This is the most fundamental thing you have to ensure yourself, okay? That your design is capable of driving all the poles into the left-hand side. Cool, okay, you've achieved that. But now do those poles lie exactly where they should be in the complex plane to make sure that the specific time domain uh, requirements are being met will be the next question, okay? So in other words, now that you know that you want your poles here, where do you want them exactly? Do you want them there and call it the day? Or maybe they need to be here. Or I don't know, here. Who's going to decide? The time domain specifications will decide where the poles exactly need to be. Okay? So in other words, the process will be to take those specifications from the client, turn them into pole locations. And based on the pole locations that you want, you're going to relate that to the calculation of your control gains, all right? And then the control gains will be implemented in the onboard computer of your spacecraft with uh, the specific values that you would have calculated to make sure that the closing poles of everything end up exactly where they need to satisfy or to meet the time domain specifications or requirements, okay? That's the jilt of it. So, when we talk about time domain specifications, we have two categories that we'll have to consider. The first category is known as transient specifications. And the second one will be the steady state specifications, specs, okay? So the first thing we want to have a look at today is transient specifications. And then we're going to end or wrap this up with a quick numerical example because I know that you guys love playing with numbers to ensure that you can actually apply the theory seen in class to a practical situation. So that is going to be the focus for today. And then in the next class, we're going to have a look at steady state uh, specifications. So transient will be in 5.4.1.
friends, yeah. Time domain specifications. Uh, as a heads up, those specifications are typically, or let's say always, and then seen otherwise, are always given in terms of a step input command, okay? So assuming that the desired or the reference signal is a step input or just a constant with an amplitude of one as time goes by. This is just a standard so that among control engineers and between control engineers and the client, we know exactly what we're talking about at every time or at any time, okay? Such that the client will say, okay, I'd like to have a maximum overshoot of 10%, and that'll be it. Who wouldn't say 10% overshoot when the reference signal is this or that? Because 10% overshoot is understood in the field to mean that when the reference signal is a step input, the maximum overshoot is calculated like that. Take the maximum peak, you compare that with the constant value of 1, turn that into percentage, and call it NP, maximum overshoot in percentage. Okay? This way, we kind of standardize the way that control systems are being designed. It's just the common language in control system field. Okay? Stabilization time is known to be meaning the 2% of your final value. How long does it take you to reach 2%? That's what stabilization time needs. Uh, the rise time. Clients won't explain to you what rise time means. Rise time is known to be whenever the output crosses the first time the amplitude of 1. Okay? So all those things we want to talk about. But first, let's ensure that we do have all of our poles in the left-hand side of the complex plane as I've mentioned previously. So to do this work, I'm, I'm going to pick a specific example that, will, that I will commonly go back and go back over and over again. And that is going to be our spacecraft attitude motion, obviously, right? This is attitude control. But we're going to assume that we're going to use the PD controller. Why? Because again, PD is used in about 90% of all control applications out there in the real world. It is so robust. It doesn't rely on an exact model for its implementation. Uh, it doesn't have the integrator wind up a negative effect. Uh, it, it is not that susceptible to time delays, or it is, it is a lot more robust to time delays as compared to its PID counterpart. But it is a lot better than just a proportional controller. So this is the happy medium. Safe, robust, reliable, good choice, okay? Uh, here I'm going to do the work for our modified PD controller, which implies, yes, you're right. It implies that the reference signal is going to be a constant. So in terms of block scheme diagram, it means that my R of S comes in, gets compared to the current spacecraft angle Y of S plus minus this generates the angle error between the desired angle and the current one. This is then multiplied with the proportional control gain, KP. This control gain times the error is being added or subtracted, sorry, from KDS of the actual plant output. And our plant, in terms of transfer function, if you remember, this is the double integrator dynamical model, 1 over J S squared for spacecraft rotational motion about a single axis whenever the angular velocity is considered to be small. Okay? So this outputs a new outputs in null y, which is being fed to this branch. So this is the angle of the spacecraft times kd. Well, the angle times s becomes 
the rate of change in that angle times KD and minus. If you go back to the modified PD controller, right, you had U equal KP error minus KDS times the error times Y. Because the derivative of the error, this is a constant, so the derivative of that is zero, and there, therefore you end up with minus SY like that. Okay? This is a modified PD control law. So that's why here you have KDS, and the S term here in the Laplace domain is just to ensure that you take the derivative of that signal. All right. And then this is also being fed back to generate the error for the PD uh, for the KP term. So this is the modified PD controller applied to single axis spacecraft rotational motion. All right. Do we know how to uh, re-express those two transfer functions? Because that is indeed a transfer function. There's the main. Right? Well, this is our uh, feedback connection we talked about at the beginning of chapter 5 when I kind of did a brief review of transfer functions. If you go back there, you will notice that those two could be combined into a single transfer function. That'll be 1 over j s squared plus K, D, S. There you go. A lot nicer. Okay? By the way, if you want to do well in this course, make sure you can do those tricks on the fly and real quick. Okay? So I had a feedback connection between two transfer functions. I could take the long way and analyze uh, all of the individual signals back and forth with the two summator block and last side of where I was and make an error or just combine and stack them all up into this, okay? It is a lot easier to do it this way. I can go one step further and multiply the KP with that directly, right? Because this is just a series connection. KP, boom, wow. That I like a lot better than before. There's only one transfer function. So whatever you have in the main loop, when you disconnect the feedback loop here, right? this loop is now disconnected or doesn't exist anymore, only the upper loop that relates now the input or the reference signal to the output of your plant is known as the open loop transfer function and is denoted by G O L. Okay? When you close the loop, and you reattach the feedback signal here, now the overall transfer function that relates R to Y will be referred to as the closed loop transfer function denoted by G C L. So, because the feedback is there, obviously, right? We had a PD controller or a modified PD controller applied to spacecraft rotational dynamics about one axis. It means that we need to consider the closed loop transfer function. We want to say that closed loop transfer function in that case, in that configuration, is always going to be G open loop over 1 plus G open loop. That is a quick trick you can use anytime you get that uh, unity feedback uh, configuration. Okay. Open loop is this. So KP over J S square plus KDS. All this over 1 plus KP over J S square plus K D that multiplies S. 
or you're going to put everything onto the same denominator and end up with kp over j s square plus k d s plus k p right because this term will cancel out that term and you're going to get one which was turned into j s square plus k d s and therefore plus k p in the end here and that's the d if you were wondering okay This transfer function can further be rewritten as follows. It's going to go from here to here, right to left, not very conventional, unless you're Japanese, I guess, uh, which I love Japanese tradition, by the way, and that's one of the reasons why I started to drink uh, green tea many, many years ago. One of my passions is bonsai gardening, okay? so. No, knock on Japanese uh, traditional when I said you go from right to left. I very much admire the Japanese tradition, okay? So, uh, what I'm going to do next is to re-express that closed transfer function by dividing with J everywhere. So I can have my double integrator signal on its own here, S squared plus KDS over j plus k p over j and here on top i'm going to get k p over j okay does this look familiar to you if you've done feedback control systems which i assume you did because it's supposed to be a prerequisite for this course that should look a lot like a second order transfer function, right? But typically second order transfer functions are generically written as omega n, the natural frequency over s square plus two zeta omega n. S. Yeah. Plus omega n square. Right? Hopefully that rings a bell. Uh, so just by looking at the similarities between what we ended up with for the very specific case of throwing a modified PD controller applied to spacecraft rotational motion map one axis, we ended up with this. We know that the second order transfer function happens to be this. So just by doing the mapping, we can say that, okay, no problem. I'm gonna set my omega n to be equal to kp over j and my two zeta omega n term equal to kd over j. Now, what does this refer to? Well, this refers to the natural frequency of the system. Or in other words, the undamped frequency of the system, the one that is not being impacted by the damping action of the control law. This is omega n. Zeta is referred to as your damping ratio or damping factor it doesn't matter it's the same thing okay so all in all this is to say that a spacecraft rotational motion controlled by a modified pd controller ends up to be a second order transfer function and that is fantastic news because we know how to deal with that very well we've played with second order transfer functions all our life didn't we i.e. during the past course, feedback control system. That's what I mean, I meant by all of our lives. Okay? Because if you were to get the 
uh, poles of that system. You would see that those poles are actually located at S equal zeta minus zeta omega n. This quantifies the real part of my complex poles in the complex plane plus minus square root of 1. Let me, let me write it with plus minus omega n. I'm going to write it with omega d, but uh, that's fine. Square root of 1 minus zeta square times j. Okay? That means that the pole locations are dictated solely by zeta and omega n. And those are directly related to kp and kd, which means that as a control system engineer working on a given spacecraft, you have total control of where the poles of that closed loop system of your uh, dynamics of the control system uh, with the feedback loop are going to end up at in the complex plane. And that is great because then you'll be able to translate the customer time domain transient specifications into desired pole locations and adjust your KP and adjust your KD till you end up with those closed loop poles exactly where you want them to be and get a promotion. Okay? So, one of the key parameters of this is zeta, okay? Zeta has a great impact on the pole locations in the complex plane. And specifically, there are four cases that can take place. Well, first off, let's go back to our most fundamental requirement, and that was to obtain all the poles in the left-hand side of the complex plane. Zeta is a positive number, and so is omega n, which means that yes, you've achieved it because this corresponds to the real part of your poles. Well, if the real part happens to be negative, guess what? You end up in the left-hand side. Let me explain. Yes, you did it. You've ensured that you're going to obtain asymptotic stability. Finally, yeah, no more just poor stability with passive techniques. We're better than that, right? We can use actuators and drive the spacecraft exactly where we want and stay there. Forget about those nasty oscillations about the reference signal. This is old school, right? Modern control knows better than that. Okay. Uh, I kind of diverged a little bit here. But yeah, Zeta is a real contributor to the pole locations. And again, there are going to be four cases to look at. Case one is whenever Zeta is equal to zero. That'd be a risky situation because that means that your poles won't have any real part, are going to lie directly on the imaginary axis at a value plus minus omega n times one and j. So your poles Thank God they're not on top of each other because that would mean instability with linear growth. But I here and here, oh, so close to the unstable region. I wouldn't dare putting my closed loop poles with a control system directly in the imaginary axis because in terms of time domain, that translates into, as you know, sustained oscillations. Okay? Or in other words, stability. Uh, I said that the objective was to get asymptotic stability, so that kind of defies the purpose a little bit. So don't ever use that, okay? Zeta equal to zero is known as a non damp system or response. We want to say response. Undamped, undamped 
Response, not two step. Come on. Response. Okay? Or you're essentially back to your proportional only control gain. No more beneficial effect provided by uh, the damping term in the control law. So that's not too good. Your boss won't be happy about you. Case two. Is whenever zeta is comprised between zero and one. Okay? So now we're getting what's known as a non damp response, which is better than undamped or no damping at all. Now we're getting a little bit of damping. That's what it means. So in terms of time domain, you would see those oscillations dampening out and converging to a given value. That's great. Okay? Because now the poles will be located at minus zeta omega n. So now the real part is not going to be zero, but it is going to be negative. Plus minus omega n square root of one minus zeta square times j. This part here, by the way, is known as the damp frequency as opposed to the natural frequency which is just omega m. So in other words the damp frequency is function of the natural frequency and is denoted by omega d. Okay so now the poles are now located on the left-hand side of the plane with uh, complex components. So real components being negative and complex conjugates like that. That's great, fantastic. It doesn't tell you exactly where they're going to be located, but if you ensure that your, well, zeta, not one, obviously, if your zeta is comprised between 0 and 1, that's great news because you are somewhere in the left-hand side of the complex plane. And you're going to get something that will stabilize to a constant value as time goes by. Fantastic. But there's a case 3. Case 3 is referred to as critically damp and happens whenever zeta is exactly equal to 1. That means that the response is going to look like that. Critically damp meaning that there's no more oscillations. Okay? In that situation, if you go back to uh, the generic pole locations. If you have zeta equal to 1, you end up with your poles being at minus omega n simply. Yes, because it's cancelled effectively the uh, imaginary components. Boom. Boom, a pair of poles on the real axis. Just like that. Okay? That's not a problem. Again, as long as the poles are not on top of each other along the imaginary axis, that would be unstable with linear growth. But here, it just means that you're not getting any oscillations. Okay? There's no more frequency behavior, uh, frequency related behavior, because as poles move up, or down along the imaginary axis, then there are always a pair of them, right? 
which implies that there's going to be oscillations. But as the oscillations or as the poles get closer and closer to the real axis by diminishing their imaginary component, then the oscillations start decreasing. And finally, directly along the real axis, there's no more oscillations as seen by that behavior. Okay? Critically damped. response. It's zeta equal to 1. And the last case, that was case 3. Case number 4 is whenever zeta is larger than 1. Never seen it in practice. Never, never, never. Doesn't mean it cannot be used. Doesn't mean it's not being used, but myself. And I've been doing that for 15 years. I've never seen that in my life, okay? And this is known as overdamp. Okay? The response will look similar to the critically damp, but if you were to plot both, you get critically damp, and overdamp would reach there, but even in a smoother fashion, what would take longer to converge to the same value. In that case, you get the poles your two poles at minus zeta omega n plus minus omega n square root of zeta minus 1, and there's no more j, meaning that you get two poles, uh, but both being on the real axis, okay? Real axis, imaginary axis. So you get your minus zeta omega n, say here, plus or plus a contribution and minus contribution. So your two poles are right here. So two distinct poles on the real axis. That's what you get for an overdamped response. Okay? So, Let's plot all four kind of response that are dictated by the selection of zeta on the same graph to discuss things a little bit more. Boom, boom, time axis, output of the plant or the rotation angle as function of time. Standard way of specifying things unit, uh, step unit function. So our desired angle is going to be one, like that. So the first kind of response we saw was the undamped response. Reach, start oscillating, and never end oscillating about the reference. This is zeta equal to zero. There's no damping of the oscillations. Okay? The other response we obtained was the underdamp, which was kind of neat, because now those oscillations are going to get damped with time and will eventually disappear and will converge, hopefully, to the desired signal, which is one here in terms of specifying the requirements. Good. And that is in blue with zeta between zero and one. Now, next up we've seen the critically damped response. No more oscillations. You reach the the command without oscillating about it, critically damp. Zeta equal one. Over damp. Black. Will look something like this. Even smoother response without oscillations. Like that. Okay? And that is zeta larger than one. So there is a trade off. The more oscillations you get, right, if you compare on the damped 
to those two, for example. You have more oscillations, but you get there quickly. Well, maybe the graph is inaccurate because it doesn't look like the oscillation damp out as quick as they should, perhaps. But that's what you should have seen in this, in this plot, okay? I apologize for that. So the trade-off, to put it in words, is that more oscillations means faster response time. On the other hand, the less oscillations you have, or the smoother you get there, well, you're going to get there, but just in a much slower fashion. The slower, cool. Slower response time. Okay? So due to the fact that the response of our system uh, look like that, or let's say the majority of linear systems will all have a response that looks like that, the uh, transient time domain specifications are specified with the generic case which is the under damp uh, response, okay? So let's have a look at the different specifications in terms of requirements that we'll need to satisfy, okay? okay. Output or rotational, rotational angle in our case. We want step unit function here. That's our objective. And we specify the kind of response we want based on that. So the first uh, specification that's going to be provided to you, let me draw them in red, is going to be the maximum overshoot denoted by empty, or in other words, by how much are we overshooting the amplitude of one, which is our set point here, and that will be in percentage, empty. The next one is known as rise time. How long do we want the system to take before it reaches the command for the first time? Okay, TR. We can also specify TP, the time at which we reach the first peak. Okay, and the last one is known as TS, stabilization time. And that is the first time that the response of the system reaches and stay within 2% of the final value. So we take final value plus minus 2% and we draw like boundaries like that, plus minus 2% of final value and we observe oh here we are within two percent do we stay within two percent no go out here oh go back in here and stay within two percent so meaning that based on this diagram our ts would be actually here stabilization time at two percent now sometimes some client would specify a ts but within a different tolerance. Instead of employing 2% as a tolerance to define this time, they would use 5%, okay? Or 1%, in very rare occasions. But that would be specified, okay? So they would say TS, 
5%. So instead of taking 2%, you would enlarge those uh, margin, or what did I just employ the word? Uh, help me out here. Looking for a specific word, tolerance. You enlarge the tolerance from 2% up to 5%, or they could say TS at 1%, meaning that this tolerance gets tighter and the time would probably be longer to stay within the 1%. But if it's not specified and just mentioned as TS, it is implied that this is 2% of the final value. All right? So now the question is, okay, well, how am I going to relate uh, those specifications, those four, to the positions of my closed loop poles in a complex plane? Or in other words, how to relate those to zeta and omega n? Or alternatively, how am I going to calculate kp and kd, my modified PD controller, to ensure that these are being met? Okay. Well, we just have to define what those specs mean in terms of uh, math equations. Okay? My microphone is bugging me tonight. The battery is always sticking out of my shirt. Okay. So, PS2%. First one to look at is calculated by taking 3.9, okay, 3.9, and I wrote 2, 3.2, it's getting late, 3.9 over zeta omega n, which means that only the real part of your complex uh, conjugate poles in a complex plane has an influence on the stabilization time at 2%. And the way it works is that if you go back to your complex plane, real imaginary, what matters is only the real part, such that you can draw a line here. And any poles on that line would share the same uh, stabilization time. So I'm going to say this is the line of constant stabilization time. For any given poles along this line, you're going to get or calculate the same TS because it's going to be always 3.9 over zeta omega n. Poles that are to the right of this are going to have a longer TS, which means that TS will be higher because this is going to be smaller. Going, you're, you are moving closer to zero real part, so the denominator goes up, and thereby this uh, denominator, denominator goes down, and therefore TS goes up. So that's not that good, right? Because what you'd like to have is a fast stabilization time. You don't want to have to wait for two hours for your spacecraft to oscillate and oscillate. And after two hours, oh, you're there, 2%. No, you want something a lot more reasonable, okay? Maybe 30 seconds to be something more reasonable. So you don't want the real part of your poles to be so small that it takes forever to stabilize. You want them a little bit further to the left, okay? Essentially, you want your poles to be to the left of whatever value specified to you or directly along the specified value. Because it is always a good idea to uh, over-design a little bit. So the spec says, I want TS to be 30 seconds. And you calculate 30 seconds, give you this line. Well, maybe you would choose to place the poles a little bit further to the left. Such that you stabilize in, did I say 30? So maybe in 28 seconds. Without overcharging the, the client. So for the same price, you give it a better design so that client comes back to the company and you know hires a company again to design the control system of the next spacecraft and all of the series okay uh, 
and this way you will ensure a long-lasting career in the spacecraft attitude control field. Good design. Okay. Uh, is there anything else I want to say about that? No, that's it for TS. So this is how you relate the position of the poles to that specific uh, requirement here, just by looking at the real value, real part, which is indeed your zeta omega m. Next one is TR, the rise time, or the time it takes for the system to reach the command for the first time. TR. TR is actually calculated by taking pi minus an angle denoted beta over omega d, the damp frequency, or if you remember the definition, it's going to be pi over beta, uh, pi minus beta over your omega n, square root of 1 minus zeta square. Now, those things I can understand. We've talked about those, but what is beta? Well, let's have a closer look at beta. Where well, beta is actually graphically real imaginary. If you have a pair or yeah, a pair of complex conjugates in a complex plane like that, beta happens to be the angle that a given pole draws with respect to the real axis. Uh, positive clockwise, zero along the real axis. So this is angle beta like that. And similarly, because you know that the complex plane is always uh, symmetric, so beta has to be here as well, okay? Such that pi minus beta is actually this angle here. That's your pi minus beta that you need to the numerator to calculate your rise time. All right. So graphically, this is the imaginary part of my pole, or omega d. Same thing. That means that if you were to take tan of beta, that would be your imaginary part over the real part of your pole. So imaginary over real part, or in other words, omega d over zeta omega m. And if you go back to the definition of omega d, you could cancel out the two omega n's and just rewrite that tan beta will be square root of 1 minus zeta square over zeta. Okay? Now in terms of drawing a line for constant rise time, as we did for the constant uh, stabilization time on the vertical line, this back translates into a curved line. Because this is closely related to the imaginary component and the real component, okay? So the more you increase the real component of your pole, the more you have to increase their imaginary component as well. And this is a nonlinear curve because you are using tan of an angle to calculate the angle. So this line here is constant rise time. Anything below those two curves will be a slower rise time. Not too good because you want to do a little bit better than the spec. Okay, So this is just to meet the spec in terms of rise time. You need to ensure that the poles are direct you know, anywhere on, the, on those lines. But if you want a faster response, you need to be outside the curved lines here. So I'll give you a uh, lower TR, or in other words, a faster 
response. You're going to reach the first, or you're going to cross the desired command faster. Okay? So you see where we're going with those regions of eligible positions for the polls, right? Because now you, you have a spec on TS, you had a spec on TR. So you need to merge those two locations together to figure out eligible positions for the polls. That was the eligible region for meeting the stabilization time spec. This is the allowable region to meet the rise time spec. So therefore, to meet, if you want to meet both simultaneously, you need to have your poles in the at the intersection of both regions, right there. Because here, yes, you meet the spec on TR, but you've missed the boat for stabilization time. And if you were to place the poles here and here, you're good to go with respect to stabilization time but then you won't be meeting the rise time spec. So you need to bring your poles higher into the combined region, okay? But that's just for two out of four uh, transient time domain specifications. So the region into which the closed loop poles uh, will be eligible to place them in is going to get smaller and smaller with the more specs you add to the picture, okay? The third one is the time of the first peak. Okay, and the name says it all. I don't think I need to reward that in any way, shape, or form. It's just the time of the first peak of the oscillatory behavior. Denoted by TP, if you refer to the previous diagram we had. <clears throat> so TP, is actually calculated by pi over the imaginary part of the pole. So very similar to TR, but without the, mi uh, the minus beta angle, okay? So as a reminder, this is the imaginary part or component of your poles. So surprise, surprise, it only depends on the imaginary component and therefore a line of constant time of first peak is an horizontal line like that. If you go higher along the imaginary axis, this becomes larger and therefore you are going to be reducing your time of first peak, which is a good thing. So I'm going to say that the allowable region has to be above and below the bottom line here. That region is not that good because this is going to be faster response or in other words, lower TP in terms of value. And last but not least, and that's good timing because I've been hearing the dog wanting to go out for its evening uh, biological relief, if you know what I mean, for quite a bit of time. So uh, that one real quick, maximum overshoot, MP, it's going to be calculated by the exponential of minus pi over zeta over square root of one minus zeta square. And because this is always given in terms of percentage, you need to multiply that with 100% to make it a percent at the end of the day. As you can notice here, it, this spec only depends on zeta. And I'm not sure if you remember, but a constant zeta means a constant angle relating the origin of the complex plane to the pole, okay? The constant zeta is this line and that line. So this is constant zeta, which is directly here. 
here. Anything above here would mean a larger maximum overshoot, meaning that uh, you're going to reach ultimately the command a little bit faster, but with large overshoot. So in terms of the time domain, the response would look like, boom, large overshoot, as opposed to something a bit smoother, but that would take a longer time. Remember the trade-off between amplitude of oscillations and time of convergence? Well, that's what it means, okay? So going higher here or in that region will mean that you might uh, have designed something that doesn't meet the maximum overshoot requirement because if the client says I want a maximum overshoot of 20% and you're smart right you go above and beyond you went uh, with faster uh, stabilization time and lower uh, time of first week and so on and so on well don't try to design this with maximum overshoot of 30% that'd be silly you want maximum of the shoot of 15%. If the, client said, if the client says, I want 20%, okay? So that region is no good. So you want to be uh, inside here. Because this region means smaller maximum overshoot. And that makes you happy. This here was higher overshoot. That's bad. All right, so in the next lecture, what we're going to do is put everything together. And uh, we're going to do that through a numerical example, because I know you guys love plugging numbers and equations so that you can wrap your head around concepts. Without any further ado, I'm going to take care of Doug upstairs, and I'll see you next time. Take care, guys. Bye.